short preservation expedition. Um, so I'm glad that it filled up pretty quickly and people seem very interested. Yeah, that's exciting. We always talked about or hope to do a field school or something out there for preservation and, you know, with a teeny tiny department, it just never happened, but uh, I'm glad there's interest. Yeah. Well, I can introduce myself. I'm Rick Seaman, and I'm going to be on that expedition next week. So that's why I decided to tune in today. And, and yeah, I'm excited. I'm, uh, well, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. We're at seven o'clock and I'll go ahead and introduce Betsy as well. Um, so I'm Tessa Honeycutt. I am the architectural technician here at Montpelier. I will be running the preservation expedition next week that I'm sure most of y'all are signed up for. Um, we're going to be looking at some pretty cool buildings around property, all DuPont tenant housing for the most part. But I figured why not uh, throw in some DuPont dog kennels in there because that's one of the unique buildings on property that you don't really see anywhere else. Um, so it'd be nice to learn a little bit about that. And oh, some I just popped in. So as people continue to come in, I'll let them in, but I'll go ahead and introduce Betsy. Betsy Sweeney is, used to work in Montpelier. She started her career there and she holds a degree in art history and anthropology, as well as a master's in historic preservation. She is currently the Director of Heritage Programming for the Wheeling National Heritage Area, where she oversees the pro programmatic activity of the organization and executes the historic preservation and economic development activities. Independent, independently, Betsy consults on historic preservation, design, and content creation. She maintains a blog and social media channels under the same name, and I recommend you go follow her Instagram account, about her restoration of her house that she owns in Wheeling. It's super fun. I love seeing all the work that she's doing. Uh, finally, Sweeney is, uh, mi mission is to help people live a local authentic lifestyle that honors shared heritage and fosters healthy, equitable community development. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Betsy for uh, the uh, talk about 45 minutes about the dog kennels and then uh, we'll have time for questions at the end. All right. Um, well, thank you all for having me. And Tessa, I just want to make sure I'm able to share my screen, which I looks like I can. Um, we're doing Google Slides today, guys. So what we're going to do is just someone shout out when they can see my presentation. It looks good. OK, awesome. Um, OK, well, hello, everyone. Uh, as I said, my name is Betsy, and I used to work at Montpelier, and tonight I'm going to talk to you a bit about some of the independent architectural research that I did while I was employed at Montpelier about the dogs and the dog housing that occurred on the property. And this uh, first photo is of my dog, who spent lots and lots of time on the property and looking at said dog housing. Um, as Tessa so wonderfully summarized a bit about me. My background is in art history and anthropology. I did a very brief stint in the archaeology department before um, settling into historic preservation. I attended SCAD to receive my master's in historic preservation um, and worked at Montpelier from 2015 to 2018, which was that period of um, excavation, research, design, and construction of the South Yard which was the wonderful time to be at Montpelier. Um, after that, I left sort of the museum industry, if you will, and transitioned into more kind of heritage programming and broader community development at the Wheeling National Heritage Area. Um, we still, we do a lot of historic preservation. We do a lot of interpretive programming um, as well as kind of revitalization and economic development work. And as she said, I also do some consulting, content creation, design, miscellaneous. Um, I love to work with people that are trying to figure out what to do with their old buildings. And so if you have an interest in that and I can ever be of any assistance, you can always, always get to me through my website or really anywhere I'm pretty easy to find. But more importantly, we're talking about the dogs of Montpelier. And in order to do that, we're going to do a brief overview of the history of dogs in America. So the modern pet, as we know it, the dog that like sleeps in our bed and has little outfits certainly did not start that way in the United States or really anywhere. 
Um, in colonial America, dogs and cats were both brought over very much as functional animals. They helped with hunting, they helped with pest control, they helped with, um, on rare occasions, feeding their owners. <laughs> Uh, and that was about it. They were really thought of as uh, more like livestock. Now, in Europe, there is a longer tradition of the upper class having pets more similar to what we are accustomed to. And they really differentiated between pets and what they called their favorites. And favorites were typically those animals like kittens, cats, dogs, um, but sometimes birds or rabbits that the owners or the people in the family had taken a special liking to, and they were the ones that were allowed into the house. Now, at this point in early kind of European history, breeds of dogs as we know them really didn't exist. It was more types of dogs that were either informed by the estates that they were bred on, um, travels of their owner or functions. So like if you, were high, high class nobility perhaps, and you traveled to Asia, you may bring back a Asian breed of dog as a souvenir. It was a, a status item, if you will. And then of course, as things evolve and you know carry on through modern history, we see more and more breeds start to develop and um, those breed specifications start to become more specific. American dog breeding is comes along a little bit later, as does the country, right? And I always like to point out that George Washington is actually widely considered one to, in addition to being a founding father, he was a founding dog breed aficionado. Oh, he had many, many, many dogs on his estate um, and is credited with bringing the American foxhound to the United States. He mentions many dogs throughout his letters and papers over time, but Sweet Lips and Tipsy are two of my favorites and they were two of his favorites as well. Um, and of course, we're at the home of James Madison, so we can't talk about pets without talking about him. And to date, we do not have any record of James Madison or Dolly Madison keeping any dogs or cats on the property. But as I'm sure all of you know, they did have a pretty famous parrot named Polly. Now, James and Dolly don't seem to be keeping any dogs or cats, but in 2015, during an archaeological excavation, a partial dog skeleton was uncovered in the South Yard, which tells us that just because James and Dolly weren't keeping pets, members of the enslaved community likely were, and in the case of the skeleton, definitely were. There we go. When dog breeds really start to become a thing is kind of during the Victorian era. Once we see that industrial revolution happening and people are kind of rethinking or assigning certain properties to the home, that's when we start to see breeds start to take off as well. This can be through livestock shows initially because of course we didn't have a formalized kennel club or breed standards yet. So it started with people showing their prize winning hunters or pointers or whatever at other livestock shows. And then as that gains popularity and interest, um, kennel clubs are founded locally. And then nationally, the American Kennel Club comes into being in 1884. Uh, additionally, pet keeping was especially, especially, especially the Victorian era, considered a really critical part of childhood education for young girls. It helped establish a culture of domesticity and nurturing. So taking care of little kittens, little puppies, kind of mothering them, if you will. And for little boys, it really helped with this idea of cultivation and control and being the master of your estate. And it was a small scale way for boys to practice those skills that were so valued at that time. Now, the DuPonts were no different. The DuPonts were the epitome of upper class and even the Delaware DuPonts going back earlier in their family were known to keep pets. So I think it's worth pointing out that while we talk about William DuPont's family at Montpelier, the whole network of DuPonts earlier on 
are absolutely keeping pets. And the quote included here, I've given the wrong date. It's 1822, 1922. But it's coming from a book of letters and drawings from a Sophie DuPont, which would have been a like a great, great aunt of um, Marion and Willie. But she's talking about her day and how keeping animals is clearly part of her day-to-day -day activity and considered part of her education. And if you read through this quote, I mean, they've got puppies and chickens and cats and the whole kind of zoo going on. So the DuPont family is clearly prioritizing this sort of activity. William DuPont, Father DuPont, uh, purchases the Montpelier property in 1902, and he owns it until his death in 1928, which at that point it then goes to his children. Um, but his purchase of the property was very much in keeping with national trends of the nouveau riche or the kind of new American elite purchasing these country estates, kind of reminiscent of the old English country house tradition in the United States. We call it the country place movement. And so you see these rich guys buying these old estates and really kind of play farming. And so throughout the Montpelier property, you'll hear of things like, oh, the old dairy, the old stable, the old pig pen, whatever. And it's because uh, William DuPont is turning this property into his own little economy. And, you know, he's bringing the train there, which is for him to do business, but also it allows for the property to receive supplies, materials, workforce, um, and creating this network of animal husbandry for their children is part of that. Uh, Marion and Willie are quite young when they moved to the property. I believe they're four and six in 1902. And so all of those Victorian ideals of cultivation and incorporating uh, animals into the children's education is very, very much present with them. Uh, they were tutored on property. Willie goes away for school a bit more than Marion does, but both of them were given kind of like free reign of the property by all accounts. And we see that initially with the construction of the pony barn, which I couldn't dig up a photo off of my phone, but you all know where the pony barn is. And if you haven't been there yet, you'll see it next week. But the pony barn is a building that William DuPont had built for his children. And the quote here demonstrates that even as little kids, they were kind of just given some supplies and said, here you go, have fun, make of it what you will. And they took it really seriously. Even in this photo, you can see uh, Marion's probably about, I think they're about 10 and 8 there, maybe 12 and 10. And they're in command of their little piece of the property. Pony Barn is just out of sight of the formal grounds. Um, and they later refer to it as Coney Island, as other buildings associated with their um, recreation are built. So while they're kind of establishing their network of animals across the property. One thing that the children, Willie and Marion, implement is the Montpelier Horse Show or the Montpelier Pony Show. They start this around 1910 when they're 14 and 16, and they maintain it up through early adulthood until William marries Willie, William, <laughs> marries and leaves, and then Marion starts to, you know take on other interests, but they held this show for area children in Orange to participate and show off the animals that they had raised. And it was all sorts of different animals from rabbits to pigs and dogs and cats and really anything kind of goes. But we know in the archives, there's many, many, many ribbons and photos from this period of time. Now, Willie had a line of foxhounds. That's probably what he is best known for at Montpelier. They were called the fox catcher hounds. And he, from a pretty early age, before he was married, established quite a bit of acclaim for this pack of hounds and the breeding network that he created around them. So 
you, he's pictured here just before he marries and leaves um, and establishes his own home in Pennsylvania, but that those are members of the Fox Catcher Hounds pack. And in 1926, he moves them to Pennsylvania and the Fox Catcher Hounds in, are, they're moved to this new property and that new property becomes what we now know as the kind of infamous Fox Catcher Farm. Um, which is an interesting tidbit. But today we're really going to talk about Marion. Now, Marion is sensibly the real dog breeding, dog showing, dog training powerhouse at um, Montpelier. And we know this primarily through the family scrapbooks um, that were from her estate. So uh, you know, you got to consider your source. These are often images that she's cultivating, and it gives us a pretty good insight into what she deemed important. Um, but of the 3,500 images from throughout her lifetime, 500 or more of them include dogs. And we see over a dozen different breeds of dogs in these photographs. Setters, Dalmatians, Pointers, Hounds, Scottish Deer Hounds, Beagles, Terriers, Spaniels, and in one photo, a Great Dane and a Pomeranian together. But the overwhelming populations are actually Setters and Dalmatians. This was a little interesting to me when I first started doing this research because I think a lot of the folklore and a lot of the rhetoric around dogs at Montpelier either come from the discussion around fox hunting, the um, steeplechase races, and the hounds associated with that, usually talked about within the context of Willie, or Marion and her little terrier that she had towards the end of her life, where she would invite terriers for terrier birthday parties, and he was very much a house pet. But really, we know, if we're looking at quantity, the majority of dogs that were part of the Montpelier estate actually came during this early adulthood period when Marianne is just taking over the property or just coming into early adulthood and then um, taking over the property. And the focus is not just foxhounds and it's definitely not terriers yet. And you can see here, she also is very purposeful in the way she presents herself in these images. Um, but these are two of my favorites because it shows setters and Dalmatians. So in addition to being part of education and part of just maintaining this country estate, dogs have a very important part in how Marion expresses her personal identity. So as a young woman, as an, in her early adulthood, she knows that Willie will likely marry, establish his own home, and she intends to remain at Montpelier and inherit the estate. But before she does that, and before she is, you know, running the place, she's starting to demonstrate ownership by establishing these really prolific dog um, breeds and lineages. She starts to gain acclaim in a very male-dominated space. So just by way of even participating at the level that she was at, she was setting herself apart. Um, but she's also, we'll see this a little bit later, it is allowing her to express this identity and gain this practice that will eventually lead into this natural progression into the equestrian field, which is very, very male dominated at the time. Um, but even here in these photographs, she is maybe around 20 and she is at a field trial where she's showcasing several of her different breeds but primarily the her setters and the quote below references how interesting and how uncommon it was for a woman to actually be showing the animals in field trials and handling them herself it was uncommon enough just to have a woman that was interested in breeding and managing setters, but to actually participate in the field trials alongside the men was, in this quote it says, an interesting feature of the trial, but really quite unique and uncommon. And again, I say, notice her clothing because she is always pictured in clothing that is indicative of 
the function of the animal. Um, unlike her mother that was pictured earlier with the big fancy hat and the big deer hound, these animals are not props for her. They are an extension of herself. And that leads us into where the heck all these dogs lived on the property. Because again, we hear about one or two breeds, but we know from the numbers alone, the scrapbook photos tell us that there were many, many, many different breeds of dogs existing in the same time frame, which means they needed different places to live. Um, and so we start to see this hierarchy of dog housing across the property and beyond. So favorites, like we talked about earlier, the little house pets as we would typically think of them, those were in the home, like her precious terrier Wallace and his uh, offspring. But there were other animals like the show dogs, which are in the kennels. It seems to be around the property. In this um, photo, we see Link Brooking, who was one of her um, employees on the estate, but really primarily tasked with keeping many of the dogs, including the entire pack of foxhounds. Uh, but in this photo, he's pictured with a whippet or greyhound, which would have been more of a show dog. And you can see in the background that kennel is now a restroom. <laughs> so that one should be familiar. You're pretty close to the house. Other types of breeds, like the hunting dogs, were not close to the house. They didn't want these dogs to be so close to humans, so close to domestic sense. The idea behind this was that by keeping kennels that were in more wooded areas, it would allow hunting breeds to keep their senses sharp and it would also keep them from growing too accustomed to their handler and kind of keep them in that pack mentality that's you know, important for the success of a hunt, but also for their safety and, you know, like not getting lost. Now, the hounds are, despite not being the largest in number, still the most famous. And so we definitely want to talk about them. This property is just up Jackson Town Road or Chicken Neck Road. Somebody from Montpelier will have to correct me, but on your way up to Grellin, you pass this house. This is called Rockwood. And this was a old estate that was already existing when the DuPonts um, took ownership, but they purchased it for the family that would be tasked with taking care of their dogs. So this was Link Brookings family's home as tenants of the DuPont estate. So that guy that you just saw feeding the greyhound, this is where his family lived. And you can kind of see, if you're looking at this photo of this house, there's that little addition with the six over six windows. And then off of that, there's like a shed roof type structure and there's a tree behind it. Behind that shed roof and behind the tree are what is left of the foxhound kennels where the hunt pack lived. And in that one remaining kennel, there used to be more, um, but in the one remaining one, you see so many of these kennel tags nailed upon the walls from years after years after years of um, dogs inhabiting them. So basically you had to pay taxes and registration for your dogs, just like we do today. And instead of giving them a tag that they wear around their necks, like our house dogs do, you would have to display this tag or this license on your dog housing. And so it's cool, but it's also a really great piece of architectural evidence that we can look for when we're trying to identify a potential dog house. So character defining features of dog houses, you wanna look for things that speak again to that domestic ethic of kindness. We have to remember that the way Marion and Willie and other individuals of their generation were taught to think about animals was through this lens of domesticity and kindness and comfort. And so the architectural appearance of dog housing does mimic that of human housing. It looks far less utilitarian and much more like a scaled down version of a 
human occupied building. Um, you always will see human sized doors, which is a little different than think like of a chicken coop. Um, a lot of chicken coops, people didn't go in and clean or, you know, but in these cases, dogs are of a different caliber. And so there's always an entry point that a regular person just could get in and get out of. And in many cases, the dogs are pretty big. They often have this cottage-like appearance and there's a much higher rate of just gable roof lines rather than, you know, some of the other things we see in barns, um, which is a little bit interesting. And then across Montpelier, consistently, we see glass windows and in many cases, double hung weighted glass windows. They, some of the dog houses, the one that is now a restroom, the one below it, look more like little doll houses than anything. The tax tags that we talked about are also an important little piece of evidence to look for. And the other thing that we started to learn was more of a giveaway than we initially expected was this evidence of modification or retrofitting over time. So we know that it was during her early adulthood that Marion is keeping all these dogs. And we know she was keeping a lot of them. So at one point throughout the 19 teens and 20s, there would have been dog houses everywhere in order to accommodate all of the dogs that she was raising. And we know that many, 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 if not all of the dogs in those frat books were not visiting animals, but they were dogs of the property because throughout this period of time, dozens of trade magazines, sport catalogs, um, industry pamphlets, anything that's really talking about animals, farms, livestock, anywhere where you can order supplies or food, in the back they would have these certain kennels registered to different people. And we see Marion's name over and over and over again alongside Willie's name, alongside William, her father at certain points. And while they don't go into great detail about how many dogs were there or all the different breeds all the time, the sheer number of mentions that we see in the kind of back catalogs <laughs> of these publications show that there was a ton of activity happening across the property. So all that to say, that was only for a very short window of time when we think about the collective Marion DuPont experience at Montpelier. And so as she comes into her own and achieves her own autonomy and has full control of the property, we all know she gets really into horses. She gets really into horse training and breeding and racing and builds a whole slew of larger different outbuildings and barns and many of the dog kennels that we know and love are retrofitted into other things. Um, when I was working at Montpelier the running joke was every single building that wasn't a horse barn was a chicken coop and there is a kernel of truth in that because in many cases, these little dog houses or rabbit hutches or whatever did get converted to chicken coops or bird boxes or different things. Um, but you can always tell because the doors are clearly made smaller, the windows are filled in, the um, nesting boxes or, I'm not a bird historian, so the little things that they sit on, <laughs> you can tell that those have been added, but maybe weren't original to the structure. Um, and if it's still there and it's still accessible, I hope I'm not telling you to do something wrong, but the lower kennel from the bathroom, you used to be able to get in and could still see how those kind of bird accessories had been fitted in after the fact. Another set of kennels that I really like to talk about are the Dalmatian kennels, which if you've been behind the pony barn, and again, I don't know if this is still what it is, but when I worked at Montpelier, this little blue-ish barn shown was like our workshop where we kept some tools and did some carpentry stuff. But this is one of the remaining Dalmatian kennels that were on the property. Now, this lines up so perfectly in this history of Marion's life because we know that 
These are located right behind the Pony Barn in this Coney Island complex. And all of the Dalmatian kennel photos that are captioned or written on all have these dates around the 19 teens, which is when, you know, Willie is still on the property, dad's still alive, Marion is just coming into her own. But you can see just by the sheer number of Dalmatians here alone that she really is taking this seriously and doing it in a big way because it's kind of the most that she can express herself. Um, and so this one is still standing and you can see it's the same one that's in these photos that I've got included that are historic. But what's interesting is between the one that is extant that you guys can go see today and what would now be the trail, in the historic photo there is this kennel that is up on stilts. And this is because Dalmatians in particular are allegedly the only dog breed that can climb ladders. And that was one of their breed's character defining traits was this proclivity to climbing. Um, that's how they got their reputation as a fire dog, even though they were really just running alongside the fire wagons. Um, but so this elevated kennel had ladders to encourage that breed specific behavior. And it was well documented through the 19 teens that Marion's many dogs, but her Dalmatians were very, very well known in the industry and highly, highly sought after to establish, you know, other houses breeding lines. So that one's cool. And you can still see, there we go, in this photo, this photo on the right is what's left of the kennel tags on that specific building. So as you guys kind of walk through the property next week, look on the right, I believe it's the right, eh, maybe it's the left side, the left side of that door on that little building behind the pony barn, you should still be able to see those kennel tags. And then um, this giant photo of my thumb shows another tag. You can just make out the word kennel and it says 1925. Um, but through our metal detecting survey, there have been tons of hits on these little dog tags because, you know, of course there are, they would just fall off and be left in the ground. Um, but finally, I like to kind of close out this chapter of talking about dogs with this painting of Marion and her dog, Wallace. This is the famous little border terrier that most people associate with her towards the end of her life. Uh, you can see in this photo, Marion has transitioned from wearing sporting clothes to a more understated, but dress suit. The racing barn behind her, she has built and established and employed and at this point in her life found great success. And while that has become the focus of the majority of her lifetime, this connection with dogs is maintained until her death. And I think it's a really, a really telling portrait that summarizes her evolution and her identity and how she sort of proudly stands alone on this property with her animals and her um, horse barn. So that is the summary, if you will, of dogs and dog housing at Montpelier. And truthfully, I wish there was more. I wish we had more extant kennels that we could explore. But as I said, as she grew up and moved on to bigger and better things, she continued to alter that landscape. And so as you walk through and you see dozens of horse barns and racetracks and practice areas, um, it is fun to think that much of that was not established until the 40s or after. And before that, the landscape likely looked very different and included a lot more dogs. And that's, Great. that's it for me. And I do want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions. And I encourage you, if you have time, to browse through the scrapbooks. Many of them are digitized because I could have taken an hour and a half to go through all my favorite dog photos, but uh, we all have things to do. So.
Well, thank you, Betsy. This has been great. I uh, myself didn't know much about the dogs or the dog kennels at Montpelier, so this was super interesting to learn about. And let's see here. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and jump on in. You're more than welcome to unmute or you can raise your hand, whatever you feel like. Well, I'll start off. I do have a question about um, when y'all were looking at any of these existing dog kennels, do you see any evidence of the dog's interactions with the kennel? So are there like scratch marks anywhere? Are like gnaw marks on any of the wood? Did y'all see any type of dog interaction with the actual building? Yeah, definitely um, some scratch marks. And again, that was one of the earlier things where we can use it to say, okay, probably not a horse, but in terms of distinguishing those marks from say chickens or just like general wear and tear, it was very difficult. Um, so it helps, but it's not maybe as helpful as you would hope. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is these dogs, because she was establishing very specific breed standards, were generally pretty well behaved. Like when we think of a kennel where dogs are just like barking and losing their minds, like when we go to the animal shelter or something, that's not likely how the estate would have functioned. Certainly there would have been barking and especially at Link's house, I'm sure it was a different story. Those hounds were picking up scents, um, but many of the show dogs or the working group dogs or certainly the pets would have been more well behaved, if you will. And they would have been out of their kennels quite often. Like the uh, photos you saw of the Dalmatians, they're expected to kind of be out in their little yard doing their stuff. <laughs> and she worked with them a lot because this kind of was her like a big occupation at the time. Um, so they didn't spend as much time just chilling in their kennels as we think of today. This is Rick, and I'm I'm curious. You you didn't mention any among the breeds. You didn't mention any of the herding dogs. I'm curious. Was there any evidence of dogs like border collies uh, with it, where they would have had animals like sheep? Yeah, it's interesting. I would absolutely not say that they didn't exist, but we do not see them in the scrapbooks, which. I don't know why that would or wouldn't be. Um, herding was not as common in the field trials and the like different dog shows that were happening at the time period, which may contribute a bit. Um, they just weren't being tried in the same way as they are now. Like, you know, the Fiber Festival at Montpelier has sheepdog trials, but that was still seen as a bit more of like an agricultural activity. It seems strange that it wasn't, but we don't see that as a category as often. So maybe that was why, maybe she just wasn't as interested in those breeds because there wasn't as much prestige, but I find it unlikely that there wouldn't have been any herding dogs. We just don't see the photos. Oh, okay. Just just, just curious, because I would have thought on a, on a state of this size and scope that they might have a herd of sheep in addition to the chickens and the, you know, other kinds of farm animals. Yeah, and it is worth mentioning, they did have sheep. Now, did they have sheep dogs? We don't know. And was Marion involved with the sheep? I'm not sure to what extent she was, but particularly when her dad is executing that country place movement hobby farm, there was a dairy, they had sheep, they had every kind of livestock you can imagine. Um, so it is likely they employed some working dogs. And there is, on the note of sheep, there is a um, a sheep barn on property that still stands. It's kind of tucked back in the woods. I don't know if we'll make it back there next week, um, but we'll definitely see some pictures of it. It's one of the more interesting barns on property uh, because of the, the roof line is very steeply pitched. Um, and I just think it's in an interesting spot on location. Uh, it's really back in the woods now. So we'll definitely talk about it next week, but they were definitely doing some sheep stuff.
Um, Betsy, how, I know you mentioned that there were other people kind of living close to property, kind of helping with this kind of dog breeding operation. How many, do you know how many workers were kind of helping um, Marion with this? Were there any women workers kind of helping with this breeding operation or was it just men? Do you know? So we don't have a ton of historical evidence to kind of know for sure. Um, but because most of this dog rearing was happening, again, when Marion was not the sole proprietor or kind of the head of house, um, she wasn't as involved in the hiring, firing, and staffing of the property. And so we don't believe that there were a ton of people working with the animals. And Link Brooking, who I mentioned earlier, started with Willie's foxhounds, which William, the father, would have kept them, would have had them. That's how Marion and Willie would have been introduced to this kind of whole thing in the first place. Um, but he doesn't really get super into the hunts. Willie takes it and runs with it as does Marion. Um, and because he was establishing this kennel and this um, new breed of the Virginia Foxhound, they kind of were, I don't want to say gifted, but like that was enough to warrant a staff person. And then as that became more prolific, Link carries out well into the 50s and 60s with the family. And that's really when you see a, like a real prolific presence um, with him was because even as she got older and she got into the horses and everything, because the foxhounds were associated with the equestrian activities, she always maintained that pack. And so he did stay involved with that. And while we don't know of any women directly that were involved, um, again, last I was at Montpelier, his daughter, Ann Stetler, I believe is her name now, she had memories and uh, photographs in their own family scrapbooks, and she remembered helping her dad. And um, I sat with her and just learned a bit about their lives years ago. And I remember her saying something to the effect of like, she could remember kind of sitting on the back porch and stirring up the dog food because they would use like table scraps and kibble and everything and feeding it to the dogs and thinking like these things eat better than we do, what the heck's going on. Um, so indirectly, we at least know that Anne was involved. Anybody else have any questions they want to raise? You can also drop them in the chat if you want to. Well, I have another question <laughs> then, if, uh, um, Have you seen dog kennels at other contemporary sites anywhere else in Virginia or across the US? Yeah, um, I wish I had come prepared with uh, some more specific examples because I haven't been doing field work in the same way in the last several years. Um, but when I, when I was at Montpelier, we were in, like I said, the period of time where we were doing the research and design for the South Yard, which meant that we were conducting a ton of field survey and research, visiting pretty much every contemporary estate to Montpelier in Piedmont or similar parts of Virginia that had outbuildings. So we went to hundreds of estates. Um, and because, you know, they were still standing, so many of them had a similar chronology of being turned into this, that, or the other thing, they did um, also maintain dogs and dog kennels. And um, because of that universal like tax tag thing, you could pretty quickly identify them just by that piece of hardware alone. Um, and I know I've got photos of them, but I didn't bring any with me today. <laughs> Anyways, that would be really cool to kind of see on like a GIS map to see the mm -hmm. distribution of dog kennels across the state. That would be really interesting. Yeah, and locally, um, I know there's more, but the Keswick Hunt Club, just, you know, down the, down the ways in Keswick, they still maintain kennels and dogs and they've, I've never been to those kennels, but they've been long, 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 long standing and they're probably historic in their own right.
one tidbit that I'll share um, that I just find interesting. I, you know, I'm from Pennsylvania. I went to school in the Midwest. I worked different places. Um, I, of course, have a dog that I love very much. And I have always found it interesting, the regional kind of breed trends that you see across the country. So it's no coincidence that the dog that I adopted in Albemarle County <laughs> is definitely part foxhound. Whereas when I was living in Missouri and in the Midwest and surrounded by very, 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 very large agricultural operations, those shelters were full of herding dogs, of guard dogs, of Great Pyrenees, like the big working farm dogs. And now that I'm in a more urban environment, of course, you see really, really, really mixed breeds. You see more bully breeds. You see um, just a, a broader, more diverse population of dogs. And I think the just the cultural trends of that is sort of uh, an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, that is Crazy. That's that's a wild correlation that you probably don't think about unless you know the history of the dog breeding in your area. So yeah. that is very interesting. Well, any last questions? Anybody have any other things before we kind of wrap it up? Yeah, this is Vivian, and I, I know you're talking about foxhounds and the other dogs. Do you have any idea how big the runs were for these dogs outside the kennels themselves? Oh, yeah. So those um, varied quite a bit as well, depending on the breed. And so, like, as you could see with the Dalmatian kennel, and Matt's not on this call, but I would love it if Matt would do a little bit of um, digging to establish those boundaries. But in the photos of, say, the Dalmatian kennels, you could see that it was much more like a, a fenced yard in a way, because they wanted that interaction with the elevated kennel. They wanted them to behave in a certain way, whereas in the um, the hound kennels that are, you know, up at Rockwood, those runs were relatively short. Like, I would say just in keeping with what you would expect today, what would that be? Maybe like a, like a 10 foot kind of long, four foot wide type run. Um, and again, that's because those dogs were pretty much just resting in there or kind of reserving their energy for when they were going to go out and, you know, run or track for miles. Um, the, the terriers, those were mostly in the house. Um, and then there are kennels that we don't know what the boundaries are. So there's one photo somewhere of the upper kennel that's now a bathroom. And it similarly had runs that were kind of somewhere in between. They were longer than the short ones I was just describing but definitely not like a fenced in yard, probably because of their proximity to the main house. Um, but yeah, there's definitely some that we just have no idea and it would be very cool to explore that archeologically. Well, thinking about preservation and uh, adaptive reuse with the, du uh, the DuPont dog kennels becoming restrooms, are there any other ways that you think dog kennels would be a great use for currently? Yes. <laughs> I don't know if Steph will remember this, but for years I have said that the lower dog kennel, I always said it should be a vending station because when you're like hiking on a Sunday and there's nothing open, I always thought that that would be, because it's so small, you really can't put much else in it, but just a place to keep like vending, an emergency phone, salt for the, you know, pathways in the winter. I think that could be very good. And then in the most unofficial low budget way possible, we did use that um, Dalmatian kennel behind the pony barn as our like wood shop. And we stored, um, stored lumber and stuff there, but also anytime we'd any kind of restoration work that was smaller, we would just do it in there. Yeah, I think a, a vending location would be such a good idea, um, especially if you go to hiking trails. They don't have to go all the way back to the visitor center. Have to Mars bring Family supports Montpelier, get some M and M's in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if nobody else has any other questions, I'm probably going to go ahead and wrap this up and give y'all about ten minutes of your life back. Um, but this has been great. Um, 
This has been such a great talk. Thank you for being willing, being willing to uh, do this lecture for us. It is recorded, so it will be sent out to everybody later and then hopefully um, put sent out to some more of our staff and other expeditioners that didn't get a chance to hop on tonight. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, I'm sure feel free to email Betsy. I'm sure she will answer them and talk to you all day about the DuPont dog kennels. Um, <laughs> I look forward to seeing you all next week. We're going to have a great time. I'm uh, The point that you made, Betsy, about thinking about the landscape in the way that the DuPonts saw it uh, when they were there, that's something we're really going to try and key into next week and think about how it's changed over time, uh, what has been added, what is original DuPont, what might be even older than DuPont, and kind of looking at those those changes and what they tell about the people who are living there. So it's going to be a really great week and I'm really excited and thank you all for coming. Yes, thank you so much and expeditioners, thank you for um, your commitment to preservation and heritage and I hope you all have a wonderful week. Tessa will be a wonderful guide for you all and uh, like she said, I'm pretty easy to find. My website is just my name so <laughs> feel free to reach out any which way if you have any questions. Great. Well, I will see you all next time. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks. Thanks so Thank much. you. Thank you. My end button. Thanks, Tessa. This was great. <laughs> I hope you. it goes super well. Um, and it was fun for me too. <laughs> oh, good, good. I, I wish we had had a bigger group, but I know a lot of people emailed me wanting the link to the recording afterwards. So I'm sure people will, will catch it on the, on the YouTube. So. <laughs> oh no, it was great. And good luck with everything you're doing. Great. Thank you. And I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thanks. Good night. Bye.